Welcome to this crash course on microeconomics. Microeconomics is a fascinating subject that explores how the economy works on the level of individuals, the consumers, and companies, the producers. It explores our behaviors when we buy and sell, how we allocate our time and effort, and how prices and taxes work. Microeconomics and the economy in general are in many ways the backbone of a properly functioning society. I'd never taken an economics course before taking microeconomics in college, and I believe it's a deeply interesting course, and I would highly recommend taking it whenever you get the chance. Before we get started, just keep in mind that microeconomics makes the assumption that consumers want to maximize consumption and buy as low as possible, and consumers want to maximize output and profit and sell as high as possible. On that note, here's a little intro to micro. Let's start with a graph on the producer side. Let's say we're looking at the state of California as a whole, and let's say that California produces two main goods, corn and wheat. Given California's limited resources, it can produce certain combinations of corn and wheat, represented by the dashed filling, and it cannot go above a certain amount. We can represent this as a line called the Production Possibilities Curve, or PPC. Let's say California chooses to maximize its production and produces a certain combo of wheat and corn along its PPC. If it wants to produce more corn, it will have to give up a bit of wheat, and vice versa. We can also see that California has a greater capacity for producing corn, since it can produce a greater maximum amount of corn than it can wheat. Now, we can take similar graphs for all 50 states, where some states will have a steeper slope, meaning they're better at producing corn, and some will have a flatter slope, indicating they're better at producing wheat. We can then superimpose all 50 of these lines onto one big graph, from flattest slopes to sleepest slopes, representing the PPC for the US. In this way, we can maximize output by having each state produce what it's best at producing, and we can make this curve more continuous. Now that we've considered output, we can also consider profit. The amount of profit the US makes can be represented by the equation profit pi equals the price of corn times the amount of corn produced plus the price of wheat times the amount of wheat produced. We can then rearrange this equation into y equals mx plus b form, where the amount of corn produced equals profit over the price of corn minus the ratio of the price of wheat and price of corn times the amount of wheat produced. So the slope of this line would be the negative the price of wheat over the price of corn, and from this slope we can draw several lines that are called equal revenue lines, or ERLs. These represent the possible production combos of wheat and corn that will give a certain amount of profit. Assuming the producer wants to maximize both output and revenue, they will choose the equal revenue line tangent to the production possibilities curve. Finally, we can draw a supply curve for wheat, which represents how the amount of wheat produced changes as the price of wheat or corn changes. So we can leave wheat on the x-axis and put the price of wheat on the y-axis. Now, let's say the price of wheat and corn are both $1 at first, meaning an ERL slope of negative 1, and that the producer decided to produce 5 units of wheat. Now, let's say that the price of wheat increases to $2, and the price of corn stays at $1, for whatever reason. Now, the ERL slope is negative 2, and the U.S. is now producing 10 units of wheat. So, the U.S. will produce at a point farther down the PPC, tangent to the new ERL, now we can graph and connect two points on the supply curve, one where wheat is $1 and 5 units of wheat are produced, and another at $1 where 10 units of wheat are produced. This also happens when the price of corn decreases, since this changes the slope in a similar way. So the supply curve really depends on the relative prices of corn and wheat, or the price ratio. As you can see, producers tend to produce more of a good when it's more expensive relative to another good, since they make more money per unit sold. This is called the marginal profit, or additional profit they make per unit sold when the price is higher versus when it's lower. Now, let's look at consumers, the other side of the equation. Let's say a consumer in the US, Jess, has to consider two goods when buying, again, corn and wheat. They also have a limited amount of money to spend based on their income. We can thus draw lines similar to the producer's ERLs called budget constraints. They also have a slope equal to the negative price ratio of wheat and corn, since we're assuming Jess has a limited budget and has to consider the relative prices of corn and wheat when buying. Let's say, for example, 
she has a budget of $10, and the prices of corn and wheat are again $1 each. So, doing some basic algebra, the maximum amount of corn she can buy is 10 units, and the maximum amount of wheat she can buy is also 10 units. We can connect these points in a line representing all the maximum combos of wheat and corn the consumer can buy given her limited budget. Now, the consumer also has certain combos of corn and wheat consumption with which they're equally happy, called an indifference curve, or IC. Consumers want to move to the highest indifference curve possible, but it is always constrained by their budgets. An indifference curve is also tangent to the line, like the PPC is, but the difference is that this curve is curved inwards. If the curve is flatter and points to the y-axis, the person tends to prefer the y-axis good, or corn. If it's steeper and points to the x-axis, the person prefers wheat. Now, we can draw a demand curve for wheat, again with the amount of wheat on the x-axis and the price of wheat on the y-axis. Let's say the price of wheat increases to $2, which means Jess can only afford a maximum of 5 units of wheat, but she can still afford 10 units of corn. So her budget constraint line becomes more steep, and her indifference curve also shifts to the left at a point tangent to the budget constraint line. We can now plot and connect two points on the demand curve, one where the price of wheat is $1 and she can buy 10 units, and another where the price of wheat is $2 and she can buy 5 units. As we can now see, the supply curve slopes upwards while the demand curve slopes downwards, so we can say that supply soars and demand dives. There are certain exceptions which we'll not discuss, but this is a general rule of thumb. This brings us into the concept of economic efficiency, also known as Pareto optimality, which can be defined as a state of the world such that it is impossible for one consumer to be made better off without hurting another consumer. One way to prove or disprove economic efficiency is to look at the indifference curves of two consumers and see what happens if they make a trade. So let's try that with two consumers, Jess and Diego. Let's draw their indifference curves, where Jess likes wheat more and Diego likes corn more, and see that each of them have certain amounts of wheat and corn corresponding to the following points on their indifference curves. Let's say Jess and Diego meet up, and Jess agrees to give up some of her corn in order to get some more wheat, and Diego gives up some wheat for more corn. This trade doesn't affect Jess, since she stays on the same indifference curve, but it benefits Diego since it moves him to a higher indifference curve, the dotted line. This outcome is evidence for economic inefficiency, since one consumer is made better off while another is not. If we tested out all possible trades and there were no trades possible, such that both consumers were better off, we can say that we have economic efficiency. And if there were a trade possible, we can say that we have economic inefficiency. One scenario in which we will always have economic efficiency is when producers and consumers face the same prices. In other words, the price ratios of goods are the same across producers and consumers. For example, if two consumers walk into the same grocery store and buy what they want, this is considered efficient since they are facing the exact same prices, assuming no discounts, and put themselves exactly where they want to be on their individual indifference curves. If they decided to trade goods in the parking lot outside the grocery store, the trade would never be mutually beneficial since they're already at the optimum points on their indifference curves. Now, let's talk about economic equilibrium, a similar but different topic. Economic equilibrium is defined as a state of the world such that there are no net forces for change. This is often considered the point where supply equals demand. In other words, where the amount of goods the producer produces equals the amount of goods the consumers buy. The price at which the goods are sold is called the equilibrium price, sh shown as PEQ, and the quantity at equilibrium is shown as XEQ. This phenomenon of supply equal to demand is called a market clearing. Let's return to the producer side of the equation, where we can consider two main types of industries, a perfectly competitive industry and a monopoly. Let's start with a perfectly competitive industry, where an industry is defined as a group of firms selling a certain good, such as wheat. A perfectly competitive industry consists of many perfectly competitive firms, which are firms whose individual actions don't have any effect on the price of the good and which can easily enter and exit the industry. These firms want to maximize their output by finding the optimal combination of labor, how many workers they hire and pay, and capital, how much factory space they buy. In the short term, we can say that their factory space is not going to change very quickly, so capital is constant 
But labor can change since they can fire and hire workers much more easily. We can draw a graph comparing labor and capital with a horizontal line representing a fixed amount of capital. Now, we can draw several curves called isoquants, which are similar to indifference curves, that show all the combinations of labor and capital that produce a given amount of output Q, so one unit of wheat, two units of wheat, and so forth. Since capital is fixed, they will produce at the points where these isoquants and the fixed amount of capital intersect, depending on the amount of labor they can afford. Note that the gaps between isoquants gets wider and wider as labor increases, meaning it takes increasing incremental amounts of labor to reach one more unit of output. This is called the marginal cost of production, and it leads us into another concept called the law of diminishing returns, or LODR. LODR states that a firm's returns, or profit, will diminish as more and more units of labor are hired. This is also called decreasing returns to scale, meaning as we scale up production by hiring more labor and producing more units of output, our marginal returns decrease. When equal increases in production lead to equal increases in output, it's called constant returns to scale. And when equal increases in production lead to incrementally greater amounts of output, it's called increasing returns to scale. Going back to the idea of marginal cost, we can plot marginal cost and other costs related to the firm on a graph of price versus quantity. Marginal cost is drawn as such because it generally increases as the firm produces more and more output. Average fixed cost is based on capital, where a factory is very expensive per good if you're producing very little, but cheaper per good if you're producing a lot. Average variable cost is basically the marginal cost of labor, where employees are super valuable at first, but then become incrementally less valuable as more are added. Average cost is just a sum of fixed and variable costs, and thus is U-shaped. Additionally, its vertex intersects the marginal cost and it gradually gets closer and closer to the marginal cost curve since marginals pull averages towards them. A perfectly competitive industry will always produce up to the point where price equals marginal cost since this is profit maximizing. Put simply, they will produce as long as they can make a net positive profit per good sold, meaning they can sell the good for more than it costs them to make. The total revenue, total cost, and net profit can be drawn as such. A monopoly, on the other hand, is basically the industry itself, as it is a massive firm that controls the market, and thus has a direct effect on the price of the good. A monopoly, unlike a perfectly competitive firm, has to worry about how its consumers will react to the price. In other words, if it decides to charge a higher price, it must take into account that yes, it will get more money from many of its customers, but it will also lose certain customers who would have otherwise bought the good at a lower price. So, it will increase the price as long as the profit it makes from remaining consumers is greater than the profit it loses from lost consumers. This is called the marginal revenue of the monopoly. Since a monopoly typically sets its price higher than what it takes to produce it, it means the price is inflated. Now, we can draw a PPC with an ERL under perfectly competitive conditions, where the price of wheat is $1, and an ERL under monopolistic conditions, where the price of wheat is inflated at $2. We can see that the monopoly price for wheat skews the intersection point of the PPC and ERL, meaning more corn and less wheat is produced. Let's move on to the concept of the allocation of time, where we can consider two main ways we can spend our time, working so that we can consume more, or spending time in leisure, like sleeping or video games. So we can plot leisure versus consumption, where we have a line going straight up, representing the money we have in reserve, such as savings or our parents' money, and a diagonal line representing combos of consumption and leisure that depend on our wage rate. This diagonal line will have a slope of negative W, which is negative wage rate since every hour we spend working gives us our wage rate in consumption. We can then draw an indifference curve tangent to this line depending on the amount of consumption and leisure we would prefer based on our wage rate. This relates to the idea of opportunity cost, which is the idea that we give up something in order to gain another. In this case, we can give up some leisure time to gain more income and thus more consumption, or we can give up consumption to gain more leisure. Let's talk about the present and the future, which is all about borrowing and saving and comparing current income and consumption to future income and consumption. When we borrow and save, we face an interest rate R, which will assume to be the same for both borrowing and saving for simplicity.
In the case of borrowing, we have to pay back the amount we borrowed times 1 plus r. And when we save, the bank pays us back what we saved times 1 plus r. Our consumption today can be represented by our current income plus the amount we can borrow, whereas our consumption a year from now can be represented by next year's income plus the amount we save. From this info, we can draw a graph of today's income and consumption versus next year's income and consumption and connect the axes with a line of slope negative 1 over 1 plus r, representing the interest rate for borrowing and saving, which allows us to consume more than our current or future income by borrowing or saving. We can also draw an indifference curve tangent to this line, depending on whether we want to borrow and consume more today or save and consume more next year. Now, let's discuss taxes. So far, we've only covered producers and consumers, but we also have to consider how the government fits into all this. The government provides services that can't really be bought and which a firm couldn't realistically provide, such as national defense. Thus, the government demands taxes from consumers and producers alike to pay for these services. The problem with taxes is that it raises the price consumers have to pay and lowers the price producers can sell goods for, leading to a less desirable and economically inefficient scenario for both. This is because consumers have to not only take into account the cost of the good alone, but also a tax on top of that. And producers have to pay taxes for every good they sell, lowering the amount of money they can make. We can graph this phenomenon as shown, and we can see that this outcome is also not in equilibrium on top of it being inefficient. Consumers and producers see different prices leading to wasted resources called deadweight loss as shown in red. Speaking of waste, let's move on to the concept of externalities. Externalities occur when certain individuals or groups of individuals receive a benefit from something that's not really owned by anyone while hurting others. An example of this is carbon emissions. Firms benefit from burning fossil fuels since it's highly energy efficient and allows them to make a greater profit, but it emits a ton of carbon dioxide and pollutes the air, which is bad for citizens and the environment. The problem is that no one owns the air, so it's difficult to keep these companies accountable. This is where the idea of the carbon tax comes in. We want companies to minimize their carbon emissions, but they can easily lie about how much it really costs them to remove a certain amount of pollution. So, the government can tax them a certain amount for every ton of carbon dioxide they emit, and the companies will be forced to either pay the tax or reduce the amount they emit so they pay less taxes. They will reduce emissions up to the point where the cost of carbon dioxide emission reduction equals the amount the tax would cost them, and they will do it in the cheapest and most efficient way they can do it. And we can draw this phenomenon as shown. The beauty of the carbon tax is that we don't need to know exactly how much the cleanup will cost the companies, nor do we need to know what the most cost-effective ways for them to clean up are, but it will make them reduce their emissions in an efficient manner. Finally, let's briefly discuss the idea of insurance. Obviously, accidents happen, so people pay insurance companies a fee that insures them in case of an emergency that costs them a lot of money. The logic is that it's more prudent to pay a little money now, even if it doesn't end up being necessary, rather than having to pay a lot of money later in an emergency. What we'll often see is that insurance will pay for a large portion of incurred medical costs, called the premium, and the consumer will pay the rest out of pocket, called the copayment. We can graph this phenomenon as shown with a typical demand curve and a fixed supply curve, assuming the amount of available health care, such as available doctors, is constant. To finish, here's a quick recap of the content we covered. We talked about a variety of topics from consumers and producers to externalities and insurance. We talked about different factors of consumption and production, from different goods and their prices to taxes. We also talked about the price system, in which people want to buy low and sell high and maximize profit, output, consumption, and income, and minimize costs. We also talked about the idea of marginals, which is the additional or incremental cost or return for producing one more unit of a good. Finally, we learned that, apart from a few exceptions not discussed, supply soars and demand dives. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed this crash course on the basics of microeconomics.